Good evening to all the participants. I welcome you on behalf of uh, Madras Tax Bar. Today, I welcome uh, Mr. Surat Parthasarthi for uh, consenting to take this session on the need for an equality law in India. Uh, before uh, Aditya sir gives a brief introduction, uh, the the same rules will imply. First, the session will be taken by uh, Surat sir. And at the end of the session, we will have the question answer round where if any one of you have any queries, you can raise your hand in the app or you can put in your queries in the chat box. We will try to take up all the questions uh, based on the availability of time. So thank you once again for joining us. Uh, I'll hand over it to Aditya sir. Uh, over to you sir. Yeah. Good evening, everyone. Just a few words about uh, Surit before he uh, starts. All of us uh, uh, may know Surit as a regular income tax uh, lawyer. We see him in the tax court uh, regularly. But um, some of us may not know that uh, after finishing law from uh, one of the country's uh, premier law schools, NUJS uh, Calcutta, Surit uh, practiced, worked in one of India's top law firms briefly practiced in the high court briefly and then went on to do journalism in the Asian College of Journalism and then did his post-graduation in journalism in Columbia University, which we know is uh, one of the world's top universities, worked in the field of journalism in USA for a year or so before he decided to come back and uh, take up practice and follow uh, the footsteps of, uh, of his family, which, which has been in the law practice for uh, uh, which have been well-known lawyers for generations. Uh, Surit, uh, uh, Surit, as we know, as I said, is a in regular income tax lawyer. Some of us may not know, interestingly, that his father, whom we all also know, is uh, as a civil uh, lawyer, as a, as a extremely uh, highly regarded civil lawyer, a senior counsel, Mr. Parsati, was also uh, a junior of Mr. K. Srinivasan, the legendary income tax lawyer of our bar about whom Mr. Ishwar spoke uh, earlier in one of the webinars. So um, Surat in that way is very much part of our tax bar. I uh, request uh, Surat to start speaking on topic which I'm sure will be very interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you Aditya for those uh, very kind words. Uh, hello and good evening. It's a great pleasure to be speaking to all of you, many of whom are my colleagues and seniors at the Madras tax bar. Uh, thank you also to Mr. A.P. Srinivas, Aditya and the others for inviting me to do this. Uh, the topic for the day is why India needs an equality law. Before I get to the topic itself, I want to begin by looking at a few examples to put things in perspective, to set up a context for the discussion today. So let's consider these facts. These are hypothetical examples, but they're hardly alien to what happens in reality. A couple A and B who are unmarried, but who are living together, wish to lease out a property in Chennai. They pick out an advertisement in the newspaper and they see that a two bedroom flat in Arepuram is available for lease. So they phone up the lessor and the lessor requests a meeting with them. During this meeting, they speak to the lessor, they negotiate and they agree on a rent. But then the lessor asks them if they are married, to which they say no, but that they're a couple. The lessor immediately goes back on his word. He says that it is against his wishes to lease out his property to couples that are unmarried. A and B, it's clear to all of us, have been discriminated against here, at least in the ordinary sense of the word. Their marital status has been used against them. But the question is, do they have any remedy in law? The short answer to that is no. Should they have a remedy in law? My answer to that would be yes. And their right against discrimination, I will argue, has to supersede any right to freedom of contract that the lessor might have. 
and it shall be my endeavor today to show you why this is the case. But before we get into all of that, let me take two more examples to just place this topic in full perspective. Now consider the same set of facts, but with a slight twist. A and B are unmarried, but they're also gay. The lessor tells them that he doesn't lease out his property to homosexuals. Again, it's clear to us that A and B have been discriminated against purely on account of their sexual orientation. Should they, in this case, be entitled to a remedy in law? One more example before we get to the nitty gritties. An IT software company releases a policy which stipulates that it will only hire men to its entry level jobs. Now, this is a clear case of discrimination. But does it under our existing laws, under our existing constitutional framework, possess a corresponding remedy? Is this even considered a wrong in law? We will look at these examples and others in greater detail as we proceed forward, as we try to answer the question of whether India needs an equality law or not. Now, there's no doubt that at first blush, at least to some of us, the topic might sound somewhat counterintuitive. Do we not already have a set of constitutional provisions that already does just this, which is guarantee equality to all before the law and guarantee citizens a right against discrimination? That is no doubt true. But what I'll try and show you during the course of the talk today is that while the constitutional guarantees lay out a broad vision for society, and while these guarantees are fundamental to how our country is meant to be governed and how our lives are meant to be lived, we still need a comprehensive civil rights law that will protect against discrimination not only in the public sphere, that is in so far as discrimination by the state is concerned, but also in the private sphere, in a range of different activities from housing to education to private employment and to the larger marketplace. Now to understand why we need a law of this kind, we need to begin by grasping the basic distinction between two different forms of discrimination discrimination that is vertical in nature and discrimination that is horizontal in nature. Now, I will explain these forms of discrimination by using the constitution and its provisions as a framework. We all know that part three of the constitution guarantees to all of us a set of fundamental rights. But under the classical model of rights, of rights jurisprudence, we see rights as establishing a relationship between the individual and the state. They are seen as guarantees that place constraints on the power of government. And generally, we see rights as enforceable only against the state, at least from a constitutional point of view. And this is what I mean by a vertical relationship. So public law as a body of law is seen as governing those kinds of activities where the state and the individual come together, where there is a relationship that is built between the state and the individual. While private law, on the other hand, is seen as governing relationships inter se between individuals, groups, companies, etc. So, for example, if I was to enter into a contract to buy certain goods from Aditya, that is something that is seen as being purely in the realm of private law and not in the realm of public law. But why is it that constitutional rights are seen broadly as only vertical in nature and not as something which governs the kind of relationship that we might have between ourselves? Now, there are plenty of theories for this. One theory says that the very growth of rights jurisprudence has to be seen in the context of a global history, 
Now, we all know about the glorious revolution in England, the American Revolution, and the French Revolution of the 1770s. All of these revolutions were largely a product of an uprising by the bourgeois class of the time. They felt threatened by incursions that were made by the state into the economy, into the feudal economy of the time. So because the main threat to their property, to their sense of doing business came from the government, the Bill of Rights that emanated out of these revolutions broadly tended to deal with those kinds of concerns. So the main function really of a Bill of Rights was seen as something which is necessary to prevent the state from interfering in freedom of trade in interfering with the upper class's ability to do business easily. Now, we're all tax law. A number of us here are tax lawyers. I mean, so we understand these concepts of minimal taxation, of balanced budget, of having very minimal intervention from the government, how business needs to be free. That was the basic conception which led to the early growth of rights. It was really predicated on these ideals of classical liberalism. Over time, though, as the conception of a Bill of Rights broadened, you know, as we moved away from this sort of laissez-faire state to a more welfare-oriented state, we saw that the state was also beginning to get involved and duties were being placed on the state on a number of other things. They were forced into providing various different public goods. So they had to be held accountable for those as well. But still, even as we moved from a laissez-faire economy to a welfare economy, across the world, what we saw was that a Bill of Rights was largely seen as establishing a relationship between the state and the individual. For everything else, for the governing of private relationships, it was generally thought and believed that the common law as it existed at the time would be sufficient. Now, if we look at India's constitution, we'll see that it largely establishes only a vertical structure. We're all aware of how state is defined in Article 12, how law is defined in Article 13, how Article 13 provides that laws that violate fundamental rights are void. But I think what we've also come to understand over a period of time is that this traditional conception of rights being enforceable against the state and nobody else is somehow impoverished. It's no longer valuable by itself. Because there are a number of things that private actors can do which require interference at the level of the constitution. And on this, there are examples that abound really from across the world. Now, I'm only saying all of this by way of background to what we'll discuss more specifically in the context of equality. So before we do that, let us just take one example to understand how an otherwise vertical guarantee can sometimes apply horizontally. In Germany, the basic law, and this is the basic law is equivalent of the constitution. They call the constitution a basic law. That basic law guarantees a right to free expression. But this right is applicable only against the government. That is against the legislature, the executive and the judiciary and not against private actors. In this, it isn't entirely dissimilar from the Indian guarantee of a right to free speech. But in a case decided in 1958, a case which went by the name of Luth, the German constitutional court was called upon to decide whether a Nazi era film director who had obtained an injunction against a boycott of his film, which was really quite anti-Semitic, and this boycott was organized by another citizen. The question was whether in obtaining this injunction, he had violated the right to free speech of the person who intended to boycott his film. This injunction had been granted by a civil court. So the citizen who organized the boycott challenged the decision of the civil court before the constitutional court. The constitutional court of Germany held that the civil court had failed to adequately take constitutional values into account when they issued the injunction. The constitutional court conceded that the primary purpose of basic rights 
is to safeguard the liberties of the individual against interferences by public authorities such as the government but the court also said that the basic law established something like an objective order of values that must be looked upon as a fundamental constitutional decision affecting all spheres of life that is that public law has an indirect horizontal effect and that its values ought to be subsumed into private law so this is one way in which courts around the world have disturbed the traditional conception of a vertical relationship between the state and the citizen by holding that in certain cases that vertical relationship also has to apply horizontally now let's bookmark this and we'll come back to it later because under the indian constitution what we'll see is that there are certain express provisions in part 3 that in fact create a horizontal relationship between private actors so i mean some of this is very well known for example article 17 which abolishes untouchability article 23 which prohibits human trafficking and bonded labor and article 24 which prohibits child labor and article 15 clause 2 which we'll look at a bit more in detail shortly which prohibits certain forms of private discrimination but despite this guarantee of horizontal rights what we see on a review of indian case law is that barring a few notable exceptions the rights framework has not really permeated the private sphere anywhere nearly enough now one judgment which did do this though was the judgment of the supreme court in 1982 in pudr versus union of india the people's union for democratic rights versus union of india there the court said that whenever any fundamental right which is enforceable against private individuals such as for example the rights under article 17 23 and 24 is violated there is a constitutional obligation that is attendant on the state to ensure that such violations do not take place that a fundamental right of that kind cannot be transgressed by a private individual but these examples are really quite rare yet what pudr and the judgment in it shows us is that the constitution not only conceives of horizontal relations in certain cases and protects them as rights but that it also enjoins the state to take steps to prevent such violations to redress such breaches and this is where really on the guarantee of equality in the constitution we see a quite gross failing now let's look a little more closely at the constitution's equality clauses now all of you would be aware that sort of the equality core of the constitution is contained in articles 14 to 18 it's in fact described under a subheading of right to equality article 14 says that the state shall not deny to any person equality before the law or the equal protection of the laws within the territory of india article 15 clause 1 says that the state shall not discriminate against any citizens against any citizen on grounds only of religion race caste sex place of birth or any of them so both of these guarantees in article 14 and article 15 clause 1 are vertical in nature but there are guarantees that are also made not so expressly only against the state and also against private actors and that is contained in article 15 clause 2 which says that no citizen shall on those same grounds that we saw in 15:1 which is on grounds only of religion race caste sex place of birth or any of them be subject to any restriction in access to shops public rest restaurants hotels and places of public entertainment 152b also speaks about the use of wells tanks and other places of public resort that are maintained partly or wholly out of the state funds but for our purposes 15 clause 152a is more important which says that citizens shall not be discriminated 
on those protected grounds of religion, race, caste, sex, place of birth, in accessing shops, public restaurants, hotels, and places of public entertainment. Now, 15 clause 3 says that the state can make special provisions for women. 15.4, as we all know, permits reservation for the advancement of socially and educationally backward classes as well as scheduled castes and scheduled tribes. Article 16 is a specific guarantee that is made against the state in matters of public employment. Its subclauses also provide for reservation. And Article 17, as we already saw, abolishes untouchability. And Article 18 abolishes the use of titles. Now, these four articles sorry, five articles, articles 14 to 18, are largely seen or, or in fact are fall within the framework of a right to equality. They represent the constitution's equality code. But what the courts have held is that while article 14 provides the general vision of guaranteeing equality, articles 15, 16, etc., are really subsets of this general vision. They are in fact meant to be inherent in the guarantee of equality that is contained in Article 14 itself. So even if 15 to 18 were absent, they ought to have been taken care of just on a reading of Article 14. Now, of course, Article 14 is expressed in abstract terms, but an interpretation of it, which is in keeping with the Constitution's values, would have ensured that those guarantees in 15 to 18 are in any event part of it. Anyway, be that as it may, as an aside, the courts have however, generally seen the guarantee of equality as applying only to public actors. There are a few exceptions, and I'll come to that briefly, but discrimination in the private sphere hasn't quite permeated the court's consciousness at all. We've regularly seen restrictive covenants that have been placed on housing, private employment, healthcare, in schools and private colleges, banking and other services. The list is endless. But these are often not seen as violations of fundamental rights. Because even under 15 clause 2, which speaks about private discrimination, and we saw that, there are only certain limited forms of discrimination that are covered. And even in interpreting those forms of discrimination that are covered, the courts have been very conservative. As we saw, the 15 clause 2 uses the words shops, restaurants, hotels, and places of public entertainment. So let me illustrate this with an example. In 2005, the Supreme Court delivered a judgment in a case by the name of Zoroastrian Cooperative Housing Society versus District Registrar. Now, this was a housing society that was registered under the Gujarat Cooperative Societies Act. The society's bylaws contained a restrictive covenant that prohibited the sale of property within the society to persons who were not Parsis. The court, that is the Supreme Court, held on appeal that this covenant was valid, that it wasn't governed by Article 15.2 at all, but rather was only governed by the terms of the Gujarat Cooperative Societies Act. Now, critically, in Section 4 of that Act, a stipulation was contained that a cooperative society cannot be registered if in the registrar's opinion, the society's working is likely to contravene public policy. But the Supreme Court held here in this case that this bylaw, not only did it not violate 15 clause 2, but it also did not contravene public policy because according to it, public policy had to be gleaned only from the terms of the Cooperative Societies Act itself and not the Constitution. So the court said that so long as there is no legislative intervention, the court itself cannot coin a theory and hold that this particular bylaw is somehow not desirable and therefore in violation of public policy. The court also said that part three and the guarantee of the various fundamental rights has not ever interfered with the right of a citizen to enter into a contract for his or her own benefit. Therefore, that this freedom to contract cannot be contravened by reading into the public policy requirement of the Gujarat Cooperative Societies Act, something which is contained outside of the Act, but in other provisions of the Constitution. 
Now, if you compare this with the German case that we saw before, what you'll see is that the Supreme Court essentially disregards the idea that the Constitution contains values that need to permeate beyond the public sphere. What the court was saying here effectively is that the right to forbid the sale of the property to non-Parsis was intrinsic in the Parsis' fundamental right to contract just with each other. But in holding thus, the judgment was effectively conflating the freedom to contract with the constitutional freedom to associate. But even more critically and egregiously, it was also overlooking Article 15, Clause 2 altogether. Now let's now come and sort of study Article 15, 2 a little more closely. 15, 2 says that no citizen, and I'm here only concentrating on 15, 2, sub clause A. 15, 2, sub clause A says no citizen shall on grounds only of religion, race, caste, sex, place of birth, or any of them be subject to any restriction with regard, as I said earlier, to access to shops, public restaurants, hotels, and places of public entertainment. Now, you might well ask me, how is it that the restrictive covenant contained in the bylaws of the Zoroastrian Cooperative Housing Society, how is it that it violates 15 sub clause 2, sub, uh, 15 2 A? Because after all, the only thing that you cannot have a restriction on is access to shops, public restaurants, hotels, and places of public entertainment. But when we look at the Constituent Assembly's debates, what we'll see is that the use of the word shops was always meant to be read widely. Now, the other terms are fairly clear because if you look at public restaurants, we know what they mean. Hotels, we know what they mean. Places of public entertainment, we broadly know what it means. So, for example, if a cinema theater says that it will not allow women entry or if a hotel says that it will, will not allow a person to board in the hotel because he or she is a Christian, or if a shop says that it will refuse to sell a product based purely on a person's identity or characteristic, let's say because a person is of a certain faith, then all of those things would very clearly contravene 15.2. But the question is, what about housing? Should housing be included within the phrase shops? I would argue that if we were to see our constitution in a transformative light, it must be seen as being within the larger meaning of the word shops. And there is substantial support here from the Constituent Assembly and its debates. Now, in fact, in a judgment after the Zoroastrian Cooperative Housing case in 2011, in Indian Medical Association versus Union of India, the Supreme Court did hold that a private school was effectively a shop because it was providing a service and therefore that it came within the scope of Article 15, Clause 2. Justice Sudarshan Reddy, who authored the judgment there, cited Ambedkar from the Constituent Assembly and where Ambedkar had said that to define the word shop in its most generic term, one can think of is to state that a shop is a place where an owner is prepared to offer his service to another person who is seeking his service. So he, what he was, what Ambedkar was effectively telling the assembly was that the word shop that was used in the constitution was not being used in the limited sense of permitting somebody some entry into a physical space. But on the other hand, that it was used in the larger sense of requiring the services or trying to invoke the services which a person was offering. So therefore, in Indian Medical Association, Justice Sudarshan Reddy rejected a narrow definition of the word shop. The dictionary might define a shop merely as a building or a part of a building where goods or services are sold. But the Constituent Assembly understood shop to mean something more, something representative of the marketplace as a whole. So if somebody wants to buy a product and another person is willing to sell it, that would be a shop. In today's world, it can be online. It can mean any transaction. So it must, under this reading, therefore, include housing. It, it, should, it ought to include the leasing of a flat, the offering of seats 
in a private educational institution. Any private market transaction really, therefore, must be non-discriminatory in nature. So in fact, Dr. Ambedkar was asked whether the word shops would include doctors and lawyers. He said that it would include anybody who offers his services and therefore would include doctors and lawyers. What is more, if we look at a reading of the debates, we'll see that sh the word shop was never meant to be used in a conservative manner. So in fact, an amendment had been moved by Professor K.T. Shah in the assembly, which was rejected. He said that the entire anti-discrimination clause should be replaced by one generic clause that restricts the stipulation to public spaces. Now he had in his mind theaters, public parks, transport, gardens, etc. But this amendment was rejected. And later on in the Constituent Assembly, when the Constitution was finally being discussed, the final draft of it was being discussed in November 1949, Ajit Prasad Jain, in a, in, a, in, a, in a speech which really is worthy of note and which is worth reading, spoke about how the soul of Articles 14, 15, 16, 17 was to provide the Constitution a transformative spirit. Women were given equal rights with men. There were, it was ensured that nobody would be discriminated on the grounds of religion, sex, race, descent, etc. There were directive principles that were put in place to ensure equal pay for equal work under the hope that government and the state would bring about laws to that end. So he said that in our history, there's been a gross amount of discrimination. Untouchability is something that's disfigured the entire history of our country. And therefore it is that it's been declared as a penal offense. So the idea of Articles 14, 15, 16, therefore, needs to be read in its finest transformative spirit. And if we look at the lawyer and scholar Gautam Bhatia's book, Transformative Constitution, and he makes this point very well, which is that to reverse history through these provisions, we ought to read it as widely as possible. These are not meant to be any ordinary guarantees. The idea always was to eradicate long-standing discrimination and inequalities. Now we can be certain, therefore, I would argue that Article 15 Clause 2 calls for a wide interpretation to include within its ambit housing, leasing and other such market related activities. But, and this is sort of relevant to our topic today, 15 Clause 2 is still insufficient. It's insufficient because it's not wide enough. It won't apply, for example, to private employment. Now, there is no market transaction there so as to bring private employment within the definition of the word shops. It also includes discrimination only on certain grounds. So, for example, if a person is discriminated on the grounds of his or her marital status, then that's not something that's covered by 15 clause 2. There are a number of other deleterious grounds. So, let's say a lesser refuses to lease his property out to non-vegetarians or a shop says that it will not sell goods to a disabled person or a theater refuses say a theater in Chennai refuses entry to North Indians or a restaurant says that it will serve food let's say only to those who support a particular political party or a hospital says that it will not treat people above the age of 45. Now, these are not protect, protected characteristics under Article 15.2. Yet, it's sort of self-evident to all of us that the discrimination on these grounds can be just as deleterious and it can have serious consequences on a person's civil liberty. Therefore, it is that we need a law. And I think this proposition really cannot be disputed. There are other jurisdictions from where we can learn and borrow. The United Kingdom, South Africa, Canada, the US, they all have comprehensive statutes that deal with private discrimination. India really stands quite unique among democracies in not having such a law. The South African legislation, for example, it defines prohibited grounds as including race, gender, sex, pregnancy, marital status, ethnic or social origin, color, sexual orientation, disability, and so forth. In the US, you have the Civil Rights Act of 1964. This was a legislation that was born out of centuries of discrimination. I mean, we all know the history behind slavery in the US and the enactment of the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments, which respectively abolished slavery, granted citizenship to former slaves, and also granted African Americans the right to vote. But we've seen in the US that that wasn't enough. Even after the enactment of those amendments, 
America still followed segregation when it came to schools and public transport. Employment was often denied to African Americans. So and finally, in 1964, at the end of the Civil Rights Movement, you had the enactment of the Civil Rights Act. And in Title VII of that act, private employers were expressly prohibited from discriminating on the basis of race, color, religion, sex, or national origin. And now that act has, by all accounts, proved transformative. You can see it and the effect that that act has had in the most recent judgment of the US Supreme Court in Bostock versus Clayton County, where sacking an employee on the ground that the employee was a homosexual was found to violate the Civil Rights Act. The judgment also really shows us how useful an anti-discrimination law can be. Discrimination in private workspaces has just as deleterious an impact as discrimination by the state. Our civil liberties, our rights to dignity, equal treatment are capable of being just as threatened by private employers as they are by the state. So therefore, in my argument, it ought to be really quite clear to all of us that we need a law of this kind which would expressly prohibit discrimination in the private sphere. Now, of course, there are certain aspects in the private sphere that might not need interference with. Perhaps the ability of people to form and come together to form clubs and associate with each other in different manners. There will be certain exceptions that will have to be written into this law. And we can, if time permitting, we can see some of those, ex uh, some of those exceptions later. But apart from the fact that we need a law of this kind, the second question that we need to grapple with is what that law should contain in terms of what kinds of discriminations it must encompass. Now here what we'll see is that there are two kinds of discrimination. There is discrimination that is direct in nature and there is discrimination that is indirect in nature. Now direct discrimination, we have already seen a number of examples. Now if a person refuses to lease out his property to another person purely on the grounds of faith, that amounts to direct discrimination. But there are other discriminations and other occasions when discrimination is indirect and even perhaps unintended. But the latter is just as impactful and as pernicious to our civil liberties. Now we can look at how this indirect discrimination works very quickly by taking an example of the US Supreme Court's ruling. And this is a landmark judgment of the US Supreme Court in 1971 in Griggs versus Duke Power. There the court held that an energy company which had made, you know, this was after the US Civil Rights Act of 1964, which had made racial discrimination in private workplaces illegal. What this company was doing was that it was insisting on a written test for applicants to its better entry level jobs. But that written test was really quite superfluous. People who needed to perform that job didn't near, really have to uh, qualify themselves by way of that written test. Whatever qualification that written test was testing wasn't actually in fact required for the entry level jobs. So on the face of it, this requirement for a written test looks to be race neutral. It allowed, but what, this, what the court saw was that it tended to victimize African Americans because it was they that would perhaps not uh, qualify under the written test. So the judgment of Chief Justice Berger, which is really a quite remarkable judgment, holds that tests or criteria for employment, which provide, which may not provide for equality of opportunity in the sort of strictest sense of the term, which may sort of be facially neutral, would still have to be struck down and held to be in violation of Title VII because it wasn't merely overt discrimination that was illegal but also practices that are fair in form, but discriminatory in operation. Now, both these kinds of discrimination, direct and indirect, militate against India's vision of equality. Now, this can be difficult to understand because in many ways, what we'll see is that a theory of indirect discrimination, what it says is that equal treatment might itself sometimes have a disparate impact on people. So the rationale for this is that the conception of equality that, we, that our constitution sort of envisions goes beyond mere formal equality to a more substantive equality where the idea is not to treat everyone the same, but to do so in such a manner that our historical prejudices and historical disadvantages can be reversed. 
Now, I want to just cite one instance where Justice Ravindra Bhatt, in a Delhi High Court judgment in 2018 in Madhu versus Northern Railway, held that when the railways denied free medical treatment to the wife and daughter of an employee because he had had them removed from his health card by saying that he had disowned his family. And therefore, when they were denied medical treatment, the wife and the daughter petitioned the court. The court said that if the rules make essential benefits, such as medical services, subject only to a declaration by an employee on who his uh, family might be, might, might be, that rule might be facially neutral, but it still produced a disparate impact, particularly on women and children. Now, this case no doubt concerned discrimination by the state, but what we'll see is that similar forms of indirect discrimination also operate as entry barriers to goods and services which are provided in the private realm, in the form of housing, schools, employment, etc. Which is why an anti-discrimination law, which includes within its ambit the private realm, must take into account not only discrimination that is direct, but also discrimination that is indirect. Now, let me just give a quick example here. Now, if a lessor says that he will rent his property only to vegetarians, then what we'll see is that the discrimination sometimes is not only on account of food habit, but also on account of caste. So that is the indirect discrimination that is at place here. Now, let's just consider an example from the UK. In the case of Mandla versus Lee, which was a House of Lords judgment, there was a school that said that all boys had to come to the school bareheaded. The court held that this rule discriminated against a Sikh student because he had refused to take off his turban. The rule itself is neutral. It's the same for everybody. That is that everybody should come bareheaded to school. But it had a disparate impact on the Sikh child who wanted to conform to his religious faith. Now, we've seen a similar example in India, famously in the Bijoy Emanuel case. But I don't want to cite that here because that was more in the context of a violation by the state. So... While this rule was therefore apparently sort of on the face of it facially neutral, it still had a disparate impact on the sick boy. So therefore, the court said that it needed to be held to be discriminatory. Now, we've seen in India there have been some efforts to bring about statutes to deal with discrimination in the private sphere. You have the uh, sort of Scheduled Caste and Scheduled Type uh, Prevention of Atrocities Act. You have the Protection of Civil Rights Act of 1955, which deals with untouchability. But, the, but, but these legislation are broadly in the realm of penal statutes. They're criminal laws. Now, even the Real Estate Regulation Act, the RERA, it doesn't go, do enough. And as I said, in the case of the SCST Act and the 1955 Civil Rights Act, the offenses are criminal in nature. So what we need is a comprehensive anti-discrimination law that will expressly rule out discrimination in the private sphere that will subject private employment, private schooling, private housing, and all forms and methods of provision of services to the larger rigor of the equality guarantees that our constitution is envisioned with. And it is only then that we can hope to transform our society. And this really was the aim and ambition of our constituent assembly and of our constitution's framers. And that is why I would argue in conclusion we need a comprehensive civil rights law, which will completely, which will take care of all different domains, both in the public and in the private sphere. And I mean, of course, I haven't had the time here to go into the nitty gritties of what such a law might look like. There have been two efforts to that end. One, a draft law, which was drafted by Professor Tarunab Kaitan of the Oxford University, which was introduced as a private member's bill by Shashi Tharoor, and another by the Center for the CLPR, uh, in Bangalore, uh, both of which have drafted equality laws, which all of you, if you have the time and inclination, you might want to take a look at. It goes into the nitty gritties of what a law of this kind might look like. Uh, if anybody has any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Thank you very much. Um, so thank you for that wonderful uh, talk. But then uh, we do have some time also. So if you want to just touch upon a few other topics, we still have a, a time. I mean, generally we go on till 6.30, 6.40. So if you want uh, to... I mean, I, can, I, I, I could broadly say what a law might contain, as in what a yes, yes, determination uh, law might contain. If you look at, uh, for example, Tarunab Kaitan's draft, and which was introduced by Shashi Tharoor in uh, Parliament, 
it had it specifically defined what a protected characteristic is and what a protected group is now it defined a protected characteristic as including a number of uh, different qualities such as a person's caste race ethnicity and these were characteristics that went beyond those contained in article 15 15 and 152 so it would include pregnancy sexual orientation religion belief uh, nationality marital status food preference etc etc place of residence age so forth so because the what we need to be conscious of and remember is that some of us might think that why do we need this equality law because it doesn't affect us and that's possibly a natural inclination but what you might see is that there are a number of things that can affect us as well and it in fact does affect us in our day to day life you know when we apply let's say for private employment in a firm now if that firm was to say that it will only hire a certain kind of sort of uh, person of a certain religious faith or a person of certain sex or a person of certain ethnicity such a law i mean such a stipulation would quite clearly impinge on our civil liberties which is why we need a law of that kind it's something that's just simply not covered in in 15 clause 2 now the other thing to bear in mind and which this which dr tarunab kethan's bill sort of proposed bill really takes into account and, and i think it's lapsed now is that it also looks at other forms of discrimination this harassment boycott segregation etc now harassment why like if you're a student in a school that's being harassed for some reason or the other and we all we've all seen the kinds of bullying that some that can sometimes happen in a school that is something that's covered by the law segregation again i mean and boycott in maharashtra a law was introduced uh, by the previous maharashtra government about two three years back which pr- prohibited social boycott but the problem with laws of that kind and i think these laws are certainly progressive in nature but the difficulty with laws of that kind is that they're not comprehensive and all encompassing in nature so ideally we need an all com- all encompassing and comprehensive legislation that would sort of strike out all forms of discrimination in the private sphere but i'm uh, prithvi i think i'll answer any questions that people might have and that way we can take the discussion forward all right uh thank you very much uh, so the participants uh, the floor is open if you have any anything to supplement or any queries to ask the floor is open you can raise your hands or you can put in your uh, suggestions or questions in the chat box uh, i see a couple of messages uh one is from sundareshwaran sir he writes saying that article 14 is enso- enforceable against state but not enforced among individuals that's his view yeah so i mean that's certainly true which is why i think we need an anti discrimination law because article 14 the guarantee that is made is against the state it says the state shall not deny to any person equality before the law or the equal protection of the laws within the territory of india but the difficulty is and article 15 clause 2 on the other hand deals specifically with violation of equality by private individuals but the code of 14 to 18 needs to be seen as one composite whole it provides a vision for society now what see I'll, let me give an example now in a case Uh, in a US case again in Shelley's case what had happened was that there was a restrictive covenant that operated broadly within the private sphere okay now the court the US supreme court and this again concerned the prohibition of sale of properties to non white people to persons not of caucasian race the court this was even before the civil rights act was enacted the american supreme court said that such a covenant cannot be recognized by the law so if a sub registrar let's say re- recognizes a covenant that is discriminatory that in itself would violate the equality clause now it's not as if private people who operate in the private sphere operate entirely outside the domain of the state we have to see things such as housing even thing i mean if you want to get your sale deed registered You go to the sub registrar's office to register it. So now, if you're saying that a person who is not of your faith cannot have a sale deed registered in his name for your property, that would again mean that the sub registrar is effectively recognizing a restrictive covenant. So the state is involved in many ways in a number of these things. But the problem is that it's difficult for the court to maintain sort of a jurisprudential fidelity to Article 14 alone and extend these things to 14. having a comprehensive separate law 
and having a clear mechanism provided under that law will ensure that remedies are more easily provided. You can have various different kinds of remedies. Sometimes the remedy might be in the nature of an injunction. Other times it might be in the nature of a declaration. In certain other cases, it might be in the nature of a ward of damages. These are not things that a constitutional court can always do. We need the civil courts to get involved in trying to rule on these kind of matters, which is why if we have a law, it will benefit us in sort of recognizing and in sort of really taking this vision of Articles 14 to 17 to full fruition. Uh, before we take on, uh, I think R.V. Ishwar sir wants to say something. Uh, sir, uh, I've unmuted you, so you can ask your question. Uh, yes, Surat. Uh, hello? Yes, yeah. Uh, Surat, uh, you're able to hear me? Yeah, yeah, I can hear you. Ah, uh, yes, yes. The topic is very interesting. It's too big, I think, for a single contemplation. I think we must have another two, three webinars to uh, explain the whole thing over again. I joined late, of course. I was just wondering, uh, from what you say, Supposing I, I hold the, the view that I will not permit a non-believer into my puja room. Now, if you pass a law, now how far will it interfere with my fundamental liberties? Uh, this, uh, I'm just giving an example. Yeah. Uh, will your law touch that also? If that is so, then that is going to be very problematic. Isn't it? No, it, 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 it actually will not touch something of that kind at all. In fact, it would not even touch a club. Now, the thing is, it won't touch a club in the sense that it may not touch who can become a member to a private club. But if the private club is employing people, let's say staff for its uh, canteen, in making in that sphere, where, when it's employing people as staff, it can't discriminate between, say, men and women. It can't when discriminate women, uh, between persons. Or yes, I understand. When it but comes to something... Be, uh, yeah, but there will be then, exceptions even there. And there will be, for example, religious exceptions. Now, if you were to have a, so, I mean, I, this is not a law that necessarily gets into the realm of temples, right? Because if, and if you're having a purely private temple for your own sort of private use, that you, nobody can compel you to sort of, because you're not exactly hiring anybody. You're not, in fact, you're not entering into a relationship with another person at all. It's only when you enter into relationships with other people that this law will come into being. So nobody is going to force somebody to have open up their own puja room to uh, X, Y, Z person. But if you are operating a, let's say, uh, a canteen or you, were, you, were, you, or you open a shop, or I mean, shop is clearly covered by 15 clause 2. So let's take a slightly uh, different example. Let's say you open a software technology uh, company. Now in that company, you decide that because women, let's say of the, between the ages of 25 and 30, you feel that there's a chance that some of them might not stick around in the job. So therefore you place a covenant which says that you will only engage either men between men of any age or women above the age of 40. That would be something that is clearly barred by this law. Similarly, if somebody is sort of uh, fired because such a person turns, I mean, let's say a, a woman uh, becomes pregnant during the course of her employment and the employer fires that woman because she'll have to be missing from work for some point of time. And that has a disparate impact on the woman. You need to ensure that you provide equality. Sometimes that means going out, going, providing certain benefits such as maternity leave. Now, of course, things like maternity leave are also covered by separate legislation. The state also legislates. But those legislation are broadly applicable to uh, companies which have a certain sort of number of employees and things like that. But, but which is why a comprehensive law would allow us to take care of all of these different concerns. I think we had the Air India case where uh, the lady was, uh, uh, was fired or not grounded because she became pregnant. That's one yes. thing. Yes. I think I think if there is some economic activity, it impinges on some economic activity by which somebody's livelihood is affected uh, and all that. Then probably this this loss will 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 work. For example, uh, the, the example you gave in a software uh, uh, you know industry, if you say that women between 25 to 30 cannot uh, work. And probably, despite their being qualified and despite there being no danger to their lives and all that, and then probably you're de depriving them of some uh, economic, uh, you know, uh, uh, thing, livelihood and all that. Right. But supposing, supposing you say that uh, I'm running a factory, I don't want uh, uh, women of this age uh, to be exposed. And if that, that can be proved, 
then will it still be uh, uh, affected? So, uh, yeah, I mean, again, I, you'll have to. I, 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 I believe we can take a slightly different example. Let's say that you place a restriction on people above the age of 65 uh, in working in a factory because it involves lifting of heavy machinery or whatever. Right. Then it might not, it will not violate a law of this kind. It will, a law of this kind will certainly take into account exceptions of that sort. But it, it, but it cannot take into account, uh, uh, it can, there cannot be sort of a blanket uh, prohibition of on who somebody can so hire a stipulation. Possibly, possi possibly you'll have to fall back on the same well-established test under Article 15, that it should have an intelligible nexus with what you do and uh, what Absol you... Absolutely. There will still be those possibly. tests of proportionality, tests of rational ah. nexus, all of that will come into account. In fact, it will be written into the law itself in this case, as opposed to merely being a uh, and, 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 uh, and those bills do uh, take into account these things in terms of what are the exceptions, etc. Right. I, I have another doubt also. You said something about letting out the house. Right. But supposing I don't want to let out the house to a, a non-vegetarian. Yeah. Now, uh, now, will that, those things, I mean, how can you compel a person to, uh, to, to get over his, what you call his likes or dislikes and then uh, still do something which he doesn't want to do. I mean, I think, that, uh, all, not I, affect this. Uh, no, I think that is something that has to be done for the reason that our entire history of our country has been built on perpetuation of various kinds of inequalities because of things that people did not want to do because of their own personal beliefs. Now, even if you look at something like the enforcement of untouchability, it was, in, and this is an argument that is made by people who say that our constitution is not truly secular because it prohibits untouchability, for example. So the I, prohibition of untouchability, why does it happen? It happens because you have had this perpetuation of a system that has treated certain people as, uh, with, I mean, without, without even sort of fulfilling their basic rights to dignity. So you, and that it was still prohibited despite large swaths of the population not wanting to reform themselves. So it's not something that is only, that only comes out of their own beliefs. It's something that's considered as a crime against society at large. Society, so, yeah. So this is so I so which is why any prohibition which touches upon these protected characteristics would be something that would have to be given greater weight than any personal beliefs that someone might have. It might even be somebody's personal belief that they, they don't want to rent out their property to a person of a different faith. But I, I only want to say this. You might in there might be certain cases, and the law will read and in, read into its sort of uh, stipulations those kinds of cases where your sense of conscience is so strong that it requires that without that your sort of entire existence will fall apart, then it will read into account those kinds of exceptions. And if you look at the Zoroastrian society case itself, that provides a good example of this. Now, the Parsis can argue that they are a minority community and that therefore to protect their culture and tradition, etc., they should be allowed to have a housing society that only sells properties to Parsis and does not involve non-Parsis at all. But they'll have to establish before court that somehow living with non-Parsis is so antithetical to their very existence that it requires protection. So it'll be a, a very strict standard will have to be applied in those kinds of cases. But a law will take into account that because there will be certain cases where, especially in, in the case of tribal populations, etc., where they might need to be together in order to preserve themselves in order to preserve their own cultures and traditions. So that might be a necessity in certain cases, but you'll have to prove that that is so sort of, I mean, you, for example, you might not be able to, let's say you have a housing society and a housing society of all Hindus. Now, if you were to say that you will not sell to a non-Hindu, does it mean that your housing society, your ability, your sort of entire existence is kind of brought to an end merely because you have, somebody has sold a property to a non-Hindu? Perhaps not. And certainly not. So you'll have to establish that very strict standard in order to uh, meet those exceptions. Right. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. But I think I should hear more from you on this subject. <laughs> <laughs> it's very interesting. Very interesting. Very thank interesting. You. And then you must hold more seminars and webinars on this. Okay. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Ishwar sir. I mean, uh, in fact, Ishwar sir asked the last question, which I had my own doubts on, and which got clarified. So, thank you very much, sir. Uh, moving on, 
there are a few questions in the chat box so uh, i don't know the name but then uh, the the question is what will be the forum of enforcement if this uh, law of equality as you are putting it is enforced if uh, so will it be the for regular court or it may really be effective well i mean it it will definitely have to be before a regular civil court we can of course speak about tribunals etc but in our country we know that tribunalization hasn't really had great amount of benefits so we you need to place faith in the civil courts but that's a separate question right so every for everything we can argue that our courts are not uh, uh, good enough that our courts right. don't provide uh, justice i mean it could be as something sort of as a simple specific performance suit where you can so say that the courts are not really effective so we have to place trust in our courts to uh, do this job but it will have to be a sort of obviously a reformed court to do that job zoom uh moving on to the next question from mr ns sevakumar sir sure is protection of women from domestic violence act 2005 really eliminates discrimination of women because it is quasi criminal law is it not does it not paralyze the personal laws is it supportive of article 15 uh i mean domestic violence act doesn't really uh, come into sort of article 15 because article 15 speaks i mean un unless the very idea of the very domestic violence obviously would violate a slew of fundamental rights right it violates 14 it violates 21 it violates a person's woman's right to life and personal liberty so it's an act which has been brought about by parliament to give effect to that rights of to give effect to the rights of women under article 21 among other things in order to preserve their rights to life and personal liberty so it's not something that i think that i i, I don't quite understand the point about paralyzing the personal laws because i mean i don't think any personal law can be used as an excuse or justification certainly for perpetuating domestic violence this is something that would stand above any kind of uh, personal law right? because today personal law is also something that is will have to be seen as law under article 13 and when it is seen as law under article 13 it has to subscribe to the various fundamental rights true uh, there's another question Uh, just to add on with what uh, Ishwar sir had said, I think it is more or less on the same line. But uh, Mr. Shrikant sir is asking, how will you equate the right of landlord to deal with his property with the grievance of a couple who were refused the flat for the reason that they were not married? Yeah, I don't think a land. See, the thing is, our constitution actually doesn't recognize a freedom to contract. It recognizes a freedom of association. And in fact, if you look at the restrictions contained in article 19 clause 4 which restrict the various which restricts the right to freedom of association is very limited in nature it only talks about sovereignty integrity and uh, uh, public interest but the contract act itself contains a number of stipulations that go far beyond 19 clause 4 so our constitution is never seen as essentially guaranteeing a fundamental right to contract any fundamental right to contract would be an extension of the fundamental right to freedom of trade profession etc if anything and so therefore uh when you sort of want to balance the two i think the rights of a non married couple to secure an apartment is far greater than a freedom to contract because it's not as if the landlord is not able to find someone to give his property to right i mean somebody is in fact willing to take his property on rent here and is and they are being refused so they're free so i don't think that their right to deal with the property is in fact being violated at all right that is uh, another view from mr venkateshan who are, who who says that mere having new acts would not serve any purpose but enforcement of any law ineffective is the question yeah right i mean i i think this is an argument that can be made for virtually any legislation any yeah. sort of if a change that we are trying to make and i take his point uh, well in the sense that we have despite 70 years after independence if we if untouchability is still perpetuated in certain uh, spheres despite the enactment of the uh, scst act and despite the enactment of the civil rights act then that means that there is a problem in enforcement and a serious problem in enforcement but i think that's a separate question altogether in the sense of we generally any law but you have to one thing that i will say is that this statute if indeed a statute of this kind comes to be made 
has to ensure that it is an enforceable statute. That is, it, it's not something that's completely utopian that simply can't be enforced. It has to be something that's capable of being enforced in a court of law. Mm -hmm. Next, we'll take up the question from Ilonga Uh he, he wants your view on the reasonable restrictions imposed by the state against... I'm sorry, I'm not... Uh, the reasonable restrictions imposed by the state against are justified by courts by applying the reasonableness test. What is your view on that? Yeah, I mean, uh, are the reasonable restrictions contained in Article 19, I think is what he's speaking about, is are, which are contained in Articles 19.2 to 19.6, the prevailing doctrine today is a doctrine of proportionality, which has a four-pronged test which the courts will have to apply to see if those restrictions are in fact reasonable or not. And the way to see if they're reasonable or not is to see if the restriction that is made on the right is proportional to the objective of the state and that objective of the state will be will have to be something which is lawful there'll have to be a nexus between the restriction made and the uh, in, and the sort of uh, objective of the law itself so for example something which is completely irrelevant to what the state is trying to achieve can't qualify as a reasonable restriction because it will be disproportional also there has to be a balancing done between the violation of the right and the restriction made so there's a four prong test that is at stake there and that's something that courts across the world have, in fact, applied. Every time liberty is violated, the way they test it is to apply the doctrine of proportionality. And there's a general consensus, in fact, across the globe, that that ought to be the test that has to be applied. All right. Uh, we've almost taken up all the questions in the chat box. Uh, if participants, if you want to supplement to any of the points and if the questions what I have taken in the chat box, uh, you want to add on anything to it, you can very well raise your hands and you can put in your views also or if you have any queries also we can take it uh, you can ask yourself anyone else oh uh, yes uh, mr mr aditya wants to ask i'll unmute him so right yeah uh, just to sort of complete the narrative, why do you think uh, of the all the rights in part three or generally the rights that are recognized as basic, uh, why should equality qualify for this, uh, for, a, for a legislation like this and not other liberties, especially considering how 21 has been interpreted now expansively and there are so many liberties now or rights now that are part of part three or uh, considered to be basic by the Supreme Court? I, I don't think equality is special at all. Uh, in, fa in fact, I mean, uh, the recognition of the right to privacy under Article 21, for example, it calls for a privacy law. There's been a data protection bill that has been introduced, which is sort of languishing in Parliament. It's not been sent to committee yet. So we s definitely need to, uh, you know, uh, enact laws even for the preservation of other rights. Now, the thing is, of course, Almost every fundamental right, in order to take it to its logical conclusion, in order to take it as far as the constitution envisages, a number of different laws will have to be enacted. So I don't think equality is special in that sense. Of course, the other thing to be borne in mind is that these things are all read together, right? Now, the Supreme Court has repeatedly said in the recent past that 14, 19, 21, etc., all these fundamental rights are linked to each other and they have to be seen as a cohesive whole. That also means that even an equality law such as this, it's not a law that merely only, uh, you, you know, furthers the uh, requirements of articles 14 to 18. It's a law that provides for dignity. It's a law that provides for sort of, therefore, in providing for dignity, it's also, it also furthers the right under article 21. It's a law that would, in many ways, provide for further expression. The reason why it would further expression is, like, just take, take a simple example. Let's say a prohibition or whatever stipulation by a landlord that he would not rent out his house to a homosexual couple. Now the, that couple's right to free expression is in fact being violated by that covenant. So therefore an equality law in many ways will also further various other rights and it has to be seen as something that's furthering the constitutional vision as a whole. And, and, and that is what will bring about a transformative constitution. I mean, we've had this term constitutional morality, I think that is used often. Now, I don't, we don't, we need, 
need not necessarily see see this as constitutional morality, but this is something that I think potentially does subscribe to this vision of having a constitution that is brings about uh, a union between these values of liberty, equality, and fraternity. And I think fraternity, in fact, is a value that has suffered deeply over the years, and it's not a value that's considered seriously enough. And one of the values that will be deeply enhanced by an equality law would be the value of fraternity. We have, of course, Dr. Ambedkar's famous speech, which talks about how liberty, equality, and fraternity fall, form like one union of trinity. So that, so in many ways, this law is not a, you might want to call it an equality law, you can call it an anti-discrimination law, you can call it whatever one wants to. But in prohibiting discrimination in the private sphere, what you're doing is effectively furthering the cause of the fundamental rights chapter as a whole. Thank you. Uh, so Mr. Vasant Kumar wants your views on judicial impact assessment on legislation. Sorry, what did you mean by judicial impact assessment? No, uh, what is it? Uh, probably I, I think I'll unmute him. Hmm. He wants to Please, yeah. yeah. Mr. Vasant Kumar. Uh, Mr. Vasant Kumar. Yes, yes, I, yes. Good evening, Sukrit. Good evening. How are you? Oh, fine, fine. It's a good lecture. Thank you. Uh, in uh, I have written judgment of Salem Bar Association. In Salem Bar Association ah. case, ah. the Supreme Court said that uh, despite of legislation, there is no proper enforcement. Therefore, yeah. India needs to look for a uh, aspect of judicial impact assessment before enacting legislation. I would like to know your thoughts on that. Yeah, I actually don't think that that uh, falls within the notion of separation of powers because the uh, job of enacting a legislation is something that falls within the parliament sphere, parliament and the legislative assemblies sphere. And it's something for the different governments to consider and use their, I mean, and pass legislation by deliberation, either in parliament or the legislative assembly. I don't think we should have a sort of scenario where the courts sit on judgment even before a law is enacted. Now, what I will say, though, is that there are instances, I mean, and the way the UK approaches judicial review, for example, is not to necessarily strike down a law, is to not hold it to be null and void. What they do instead sometimes is to recommend to parliament to either repeal a law or to sort of make changes, make alterations, etc., etc. So there are ways in which the remedies can be fashioned in order to ensure an even greater fidelity to separation of powers. And in certain cases that can be done. But I don't think you should have a sort of an assessment by the judiciary of a legislation. If the judiciary were to do its job of reviewing laws properly, and I think we, we'll all be grateful if they do just that. <laughs> yeah, fine. Uh, in fact, I, I, I could tell that that could call for another topic on uh, elaborate discussion. <laughs> Rather, uh, I mean, because I, I, took, I took the clue for the question from the Edmund of Supreme Court. All right. Thanks. Thanks for Thank, thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, so now moving on, I'll call APS sir for his uh, concluding remarks and then after that we can close the session. Thank you, Mr. Surit Pat Sarvi. It was a very wonderful lecture today. In fact, your lecture was very much informative and more than informative. Uh, uh, of course, your lecture was very sweet and short, but the emotions and the feelings what you have ignited today will last forever. So that's the way I want to conclude your session in one way by saying that though it was a very short lecture, the feelings and emotions what you have ignited among the audience will last forever. And in a casual situation, one day your father explained me why he named you Surit and what's the meaning for that Surit. He said it's one of the names in Vishnu Sagasranama. Sir, your uh, 
ஒன்னு <laughs> wanted to tell and the way uh, this is the uh, third a uh, reformative session or a uh, insightful session into the constitution so first mr nl raja has given a talk on equity he is traced to the genesis of equity how and how those principles of equity are embodied in civil how the civil courts administer and how those articles 14 to 18 have been fit into so now subsequently we had a lecture on constitutional morality by two young speakers mr chandrasekhar bharathi and mr abhishek singh ji so those uh, they, they have discussed uh, that subject by relating to the sabarimala issue so it evoked a more response from the floor then i said uh, you just to see the constitutional morality means what is constitutionally good and constitutionally right you leave alone that sabarimala issue so if when there is a conflict between private morality or public morality and how that constitution morality has to be applied so once you are accustomed to that then you will accept that constitution morality into the other things so you have come to the third stage where now here i will also subscribe to the views of mr aditya reddy he said when all the articles have been explained well and the scope has been expanded by supreme court why there is a need for another law regarding equality or prohibiting some discrimination among private individuals so of course article 14 is expanded 19 is expanded 21 is expanded by supreme court once those doubts are coming at the same time we were able to give many illustrations and why this law is subject need and especially in the covid 19 issues the migrant labor issue that plight was very much serious and the entire world pity for them so the socio economic disadvantages i think that's what you mean uh, for justifying the need for a, a equality law or otherwise a discriminatory law the prohibition of discriminatory law so it was a very insight into the constitution and you uh, you explained how the present articles are not enough when there is a, a inequality among the interactions between the individuals so you touched the you touched all aspects and whatever the questions many of us wanted to ask justice eeswar today we had with us and he asked those questions and you explained well so i thank you mr surit patsari for giving a wonderful lecture today so i was very much expecting you to have a lecture in our bar today it is fulfilled so once again i thank you mr surit patsari and other audiences who raised some questions and for mr justice eeswar for joining with us thank, thank you. you thank you sir uh, thank you very much uh, aps sir and uh, thank you once again surit sir for this uh, excellent session Uh, and to all the participants thanks for joining us today uh, the session will be uploaded in our youtube channel uh, madras tax bar chennai in a few days time uh, you can if you have missed out on any part of the session you can always uh, catch it there uh, so thank you very much once again and uh, uh, have a good day stay home stay safe thank you i'm ending the session